All right, welcome ladies and gentlemen to uh, 101 Domains, uh, first in a series of uh, webinars that we plan on putting on um, on a quarterly basis on timely topics in the domain name space and how those relate to uh, IP rights and trademark rights and uh, just corporate domain portfolio management. Uh, our topic today is GDPR, the new landscape for enforcing, selling, and acquiring domains. Uh, we'll be going through what exactly is GDPR, um, how that applies to the domain name industry, specifically uh, who is database and how registries and registrars are operating in a post-GDPR landscape, as well as practical uh, information on trademark rights and enforcement um, and other issues that we are seeing day-to-day uh, -to -day and working with with our corporate clients and with our, our trademark professionals. And this is Kimberly saying hello as well. And whenever you're ready, Anthony, we can start. All right, so it looks like we have a good group with us here today. Um, I thank you all for taking the time out of your day. My name is Anthony Beltran. I'm the president of 101 Domain and Kimberly, who you just heard, is our senior corporate services executive. Um, she and I will be uh, walking you through things today. So Kimberly, if you can go to the next slide. So all about GDPR today. Um, many of you guys have, have heard this term and I'm sure a lot of you are, are tired of hearing about it. Um, essentially what GDPR is by definition, it's European Union's Data Protection Directive. It stands for General Data Protection Regulation. This was a policy that was published and put into place in April of 2016, which became effective on May 25th, 2018. Um, so, you know, the domain industry and, and all other industries affected have known about these, um, these directives for a couple of years now. And they're essentially um, a bulking up of existing data privacy laws that the European Union has had in place for a number of years. Um, these new laws impose uh, much stricter rules on controlling and processing of personally identifiable information, namely a person's name, a person's address, phone number, email address. Um, it goes so far in some cases as IP address and how uh, customers and uh, individuals are being tracked by uh, internet companies online. So um, it's really an all-encompassing um, directive that imposes very, very heavy uh, civil fines on companies for non-compliance. The, the previous regulations didn't have quite as as much teeth in the the imposition of fines and the language that was used was used in the directive. And this new policy um, created a, uh, quite a few sweeping changes that um, that really define the scope and the responsibilities of the affected parties. So. Um, the directive applies to European citizens. However, um, if you are a European company, um, you are to treat all of your customers as if they're European citizens for uh, GDPR um, requirements. So essentially what GDPR uh, requires, um, it, it requires companies to allow their customers to control their data much um, more than in the past in that um, you, you've seen cookie policies and privacy policies updated um, mostly around May. Uh, May 25th was the date again. So I, I imagine any most of the websites that many of you um, navigate to would have, would see new cookie policies that need to be accepted, new privacy statements. You know, I saw a wave of emails in my inbox from companies that I forgot I ever did business with updating privacy policies and, and so on and so forth. And all that was generally a result of uh, this GDPR uh, directive. Um, as a company, um, and with 101 Domain being a, a European company, um, our cookie policies have been updated, our privacy policies have been updated, um, as well as you know most companies out there uh, to become a lot clearer and more concise in as much as how we are tracking customer information, how we are tracking customers, what PII we are collecting, what it's being used for, and who's it, who it's being shared with. 
Um, the directive also uh, provisions a, a right of customers to request um, the information from a company they do business with you know, to request a complete data set of the information that a company has collected on them, uh, to request removal of that information, um, and it requires companies to um, tighten up their data retention policies um, to only retain data uh, so far as it's it's needed for a legitimate business purpose. As you can imagine, uh, these are sweeping changes for many, many companies out there. You see the headlines in the news. Um, you've seen Facebook in the news. You've seen Google in the news. Obviously, these are big players that um, were greatly affected. If you go into Facebook, you'll notice that you can download a copy of all your data that they have on you. And that's available with a lot of these larger these larger tech companies out there, and that's that's part of the GDPR uh, directive. Um, as a registrar um, with many many customers, um, we have seen an influx of customers coming in requesting uh, data removal, account closure, um, and it seems to come in waves as news is published uh, in the news outlets. Um, otherwise, it's it's somewhat business as usual from from that perspective. Um, as you can imagine, um, with the restriction in, in PII and how the domain name industry handles personally identifiable information, there are quite a few areas that these directives affect. And the, the biggest one is the WHOIS database. And um, as many of you know and, and use that WHOIS database um, in your lines of work, if you're a legal practitioner or if you're a brand owner to research names and owners and even to acquire domain names from other parties or sell domain names. Um, there's a lot of changes going on in, in our space right now around this and that's what we're going to get into uh, here today. Um, following the May 25th uh, directive, the effective date, I can publish what they're calling their temporary specification um, addressing the community's response to GDPR. Now, the background behind this is that um, ICANN, in its agreements with registries and registrars who are contracted parties, as they're referred to, we are required to collect, retain, and pass on uh, certain personally identifiable information that our customers submit to us in relation to their domain name registration. And that PII is found um, primarily in the WHOIS database record. So you have four records for a domain name. You have registrant, administrative, technical, and billing contacts. Those contacts are required by us as a registrar and registries to publish in public facing databases, which we term as WHOIS, for uh, the public to look up. Um, so this temporary spec went into place on May 25th and we'll get into the details here shortly. Um, so that's the ICANN universe as far as uh, GDPR goes. We then have the other half of the domain name system out there in country codes where we're really seeing all kinds of different things going on. These country codes generally do not um, adhere to ICANN policies. Some of these country codes do follow those policies and mirror some of them, but they really get to set their own rules in a lot of cases. and and uh, being accredited in most of the countries around the world, we are seeing these changes day in and day out and communicating this with our customers when, when issues arise and arise and help them navigate uh, through some of these changes. So on the next slide, uh, we're just gonna talk about uh, the WHOIS database a little bit. You know, the WHOIS database was originally created to, to show domain ownership and the change of domain ownership, meaning that Someone registers a domain name, the record gets published online, somebody can go to the database or a database somewhere and look up who owns the name, when the name was created, um, when the information on the name was last changed, what the name servers are. Um, so there's some transparency in um, who owns the website that you're, that you're looking at or who owns the domain name uh, that you're, you're wanting to do something with. Um, the, the original intention was um, very sincere. Um, as many of you know, throughout the years, and WHOIS has been around for quite a while, throughout the years, 
um, the use cases for the WHOIS database has morphed into a number of areas. Uh, first and foremost that we deal with primarily is you know, trademark rights and IP enforcement, you know, looking up who owns certain names for our clients. Um, are they squatting on the name? Is it you know, a name that the client owns? Um, it's important information to catalog and keep. Law enforcement agencies also use this information day in and day out to track nefarious activities online. There's a illegal pharmacy somewhere. That's one, one data set that they turn to to track down the culprits um, that they're trying to enforce laws against. Um, you also have government agencies and, and security firms that are um, constantly doing research on the domain name system um, and dealing with things like DDoS attacks and government-sponsored uh, terrorism, uh, things like that. Um, we also, as many of you know, um, if you've ever registered a domain name, you may have gotten a credit card offer in the mail a week later. Now, that is one use of the WHOIS database that um, has developed over time and that there are companies out there that mine this data and use it for marketing purposes, for unsolicited marketing purposes. Um, I know in one case with myself, um, I had published, I had registered a domain name years ago for a business idea and put a business name on it, and then I got a credit card offer in the mail a week later, and I hadn't even told anybody about this idea at the time. Um, it's things like that that I'm sure many of you have experienced. Um, additionally, uh, domain acquisition. We do a, a lot of acquisition work, and one of the sources of data that we look at to contact the owner of a domain name is the Whois database. Um, and then finally, uh, fraud and abuse. As I mentioned, security firms or as legal practitioners, if you see a domain name infringing on a client's brand or client's rights, that's one of the first places you typically go uh, to determine how to uh, enforce what you're looking to enforce. Now, post-GDPR and post-temporary spec, um, has really changed the WHOIS database in a number of ways. And we'll go through some examples here on the next slides. But essentially, most of the data that we um, as uh, practitioners and legal practitioners and, and users are used to seeing in a WHOIS database is simply no longer there. Um, ICANN's temporary spec laid out the minimum elements required to be published in a WHOIS database. Um, and that essentially boils down to redacting um, pretty much all personally identifiable information. Um, so if you're an individual registering a domain name, you're not gonna see your data on the WHOIS database. If you're a company, you're gonna see part of the company's data on the database. Um, many registries and registrars, because the temporary spec was uh, published and, and rushed through with ICANN being behind the ball on um, addressing this issue. Uh, many of us were scrambling at the deadline to implement something. So um, you're gonna see various implementations um, throughout the domain name space with different registries, registrars. Um, they're gonna differ in some ways. Um, there are some things on these uh, who is database records that um, are required and you'll see similarities between them, but it's really at this point navigating uh, the landscape out there to find who owns domain names in order to, to enforce rights or to tackle fraud and abuse or to simply acquire a domain name that you're interested in. Um, you know, some, of the, some of the main things you'll see are since individual information is no longer being published on the who is for ICANN sponsored names, there's not gonna be an email address on that record for you to contact a domain name owner. Um, there will be email addresses for you to contact the registrar. The registrars are required to publish an abuse email address um, so that you may contact the registrar if there's a website, for example, that needs to be taken down for illegal uh, practices. Um, but you cannot uh, get the email address of the individual registrant anymore. So in that place, registrars um, have implemented a contact form. So there's typically a URL in the WHOIS record that directs you to a contact form 
that once you fill out, the registrar will pass that contact inquiry along to the domain name owner. Um, but there, at that point, the communication may end. You, you may not get a response and many times don't. Um, some registrars have taken the stance of redacting um, all possible PII information um, across their entire customer base. And as I mentioned, EU-based registrars and registries um, are required to do that for all customers. Um, registrars and registries outside of the EU, some have taken that approach. Others have um, decided only to redact their EU customers' information. So I believe GoDaddy um, had come out and said, um, our European businesses will fully redact everything, um, but our U.S. business will only be redacting uh, European customers' information. U.S. and non-European customers' information will still be published um, as it was before. Um, so, you know, the takeaway here is that um, regulations and what the domain name industry is required to do as a contracted party with ICANN is it's on a temporary specification right now, and the industry is working through finalizing these things. This temp spec expires on May 25th, 2019, at which point um, they're required to have a final specification for a final working model of who is. Um, and we'll talk a little bit towards the end about what that may look like. Now, when we look at the next slide here, um, you're going to see various examples of who is output. Um, variations are due to the registrant being an EU company, an EU individual, non-EU companies and uh, uh, non-EU individuals. Uh, we still have private registration and um, in many cases with country codes, as I've mentioned, um, they don't necessarily adhere to GDPR regulations. Um, we know many country codes out there that are still publishing full his, who is information um, in certain cases. Um, and so that, that gets in a little bit of the private registration uh, concern. So moving to the next slide, um, here's some examples of domain names at 101 domain in, in our who is database output. So on the left, you have a domain name with privacy. Um, or without privacy, uh, my mistake. And this happens to be an organization. This happens to be the domain name 101domain.com, which is our website name. Um, you see in the registrant section halfway through um, that it publishes the company's information here um, as it had in the past, but you notice there's no email address. Now, we've determined, it's been determined that email addresses may fall under personally identifiable information. Um, because if it's an individual's email address, which many times it is uh, for a company registration, um, we are erring on the side of caution not to publish that information. So in lieu of that, we've created this contact form, which I mentioned previously. So you would go to this URL, submit a contact inquiry. That inquiry will get passed to the registrant, and it's 100% in their court whether to respond or not to that. Um, so, as you can imagine, in enforcement, in many cases, that's that's a fairly quick dead end. Um, if you take a look at the right, you'll see a domain name with privacy in our system, and this is following ICANN's temporary spec in that it states that if the domain name has privacy, uh, all of the who is record uh, must be published because the privacy uh, contacts are um, a business that are not. Uh, uh, personally identifiable information. So you do have an email address here that you can reference, um, even though it's a, a randomized email address that is tied to the domain name in our system. Um, and so that's that gives you a little bit more, more wiggle room. If you go to the next slide, we have a couple more examples. Um, here are a couple domain names without privacy. And this, this really depicts the difference between an organization and individual registration. So again, we have 101domain.com on the left. You have the full organization name um, in the registrant data sans the email address. And um, just to point out one other thing, you notice that the admin billing and technical contacts are not published 
uh, here either, which we are not required to do under the temporary spec. Um, if you take a look at the right and this domain name delmar.fun, which is a cool domain name, um, this is an individual that has registered this name and the information is even more redacted. So here for the registrant, you only see their state and their country. Um, and then you have the URL to the contact form. And that's all that is being published for domain names registered to individuals in the WHOIS. Um, and this is what you're gonna see across, um, generally across registrars and registries out there. So you can imagine what we saw before was an entire record with um, the person's name, address, phone number, email address, and now we're, we're seeing this. And this is the, the starkest example of a post-GDPR world. Um, so as you can imagine, trying to do your work as a practitioner or as a brand owner, um, in researching and investigating these names um, is severely hamstringed um, because of these GDPR changes. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, they are they are uh, slowly changing into a final spec that we'll see um, later in 2019. So from here, Kimberly's going to take over and uh, give you some practical information on on what we're seeing with customers and, and enforcement and research and whatnot. So. A lot of you, I'm sure, are involved in trademark or IP enforcement, whether that be for your clients or for your own brand. And with a lot of that redaction from the WHOIS database, it makes some of your work a little bit harder. Uh, one of the main things is the UDRP or URS processes, which are disputes that were created uh, according to ICANN regulations that allow trademark owners to dispute the ownership of a name. Uh, those would apply mostly to your major CC, excuse me, your major GTLDs like .com, .net, org, biz, plus the new GTLDs like .ninja, that sort of thing, and then any country codes that may have chosen to adopt those processes. So it's pretty big. It's commonly used for a lot of major brands in order to uh, acquire domains that they can prove are infringing upon their brand. So I did uh, include the three points that must be proven, the likelihood of confusion, meaning that if a visitor goes to that site, could they be uh, persuaded to purchase something that perhaps isn't the actual product, misled in any other way? And if the registrant has an interest in the domain, so the problem with a lot of the WHOIS database now is that it's very difficult to research that. Now, let's say you're looking at bobsshoes.com and you used to be able to go to the Whois database and look up bobsshoes.com. You see it's owned by Bob Shoes Incorporated. Now you can recognize that there's a legitimate interest in that domain. So that might not be such a great option for dispute. And then thirdly, that the domain was purchased in bad faith, and that would be your squatters or your counterfeiters, that sort of thing, with the intention of maybe selling the domain back. And again, without that who is information, it does make it a little bit more difficult to do that research. So since this information is mostly hidden in who is the disputes may need to be filed before you even know who that registrant is. Now, once the dispute is filed, then the registrar has to lock the name and disclose that information. So then you might have more opportunity to do some more research, but you've already filed your dispute by then. And, and upon further research, you may send in an amendment, which may cost you or your client more money. So as you can see, there are quite a few challenges in researching what used to be so much easier for us all uh, to prove that you or your client's trademark is being infringed upon. So one more option that uh, a lot of clients are doing are using the DMCA takedown process to immediately halt a domain. 
meaning if there's a counterfeiter or, or other infringement, rather than going the UDRP process to try and take the domain away, they just want the domain shut down. They want that site down. And so that process is a little bit different in which you're appealing both to the domain registrar and to the hosting provider where the site is. So the regulations, I mean, it's almost like the Wild West out there with respect to that because every hosting provider has their own regulations, their own policies, and uh, not, not such an easy process. And not being able to even know who the registrant of the domain name is, is harder. And that's because they are not required to release that information to you for a DMCA takedown process. They're supposed to be taking care of that on their own. I put the supposed in quotes. Uh, so there are times when uh, they actually do follow through with that. And for instance, we had a client who wanted to do a UDRP on a domain, but upon further research outside of the WHOIS database, uh, we realized that that was a reseller of theirs that was authorized to sell their products. But because they didn't have access to the WHOIS, that was something they couldn't find out right away. Okay. So the next thing we're finding uh, issues with, with the redacted information is acquiring domains for clients. And if you are a law professional and you are helping your, your clients, perhaps with a new product or a service, then you might go to the WHOIS database to research the owner of that name and try to purchase the name from them. That can be difficult now when even the people who legitimately own, own a domain, legitimately want to sell it, can't be found, makes it a little bit more difficult for you and your clients. So there are other options than who is for researching it, but it definitely does add a little bit of time and detective work necessary in order to uh, find that domain owner. So if you do have issues with that, there are domain brokers that can assist. They have a bunch of, uh, a very large network, a bunch of owners in their network, in which case they can recognize uh, these patterns and make a good educated guess as to the who, who the owner is, as there are owners that own, you know, half a million names. So, you know, the, 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 Acquiring domains for clients is also a way to avoid the UDRP or URS process. And so you might consider that over the dispute if you can find that information. It is out there, it just takes a little bit more work. Okay. And so in summary, uh, we have gone over the challenges of the, the new WHOIS database and how it's going to be different for you moving forward, at least until May 25th, 2019. Uh, we've also discussed the benefits of maintaining privacy, and I wanted to add one thing to that uh, that Anthony explained, is that if you do have a client that has a new product or service and they are looking to acquire these domains, and it's something that they want to keep secret for now, consider that privacy. And you, you want to ask your registrar, is there privacy available for this? Because as you've seen in all the different who is examples, it, it is a little bit varied. And so if you really must maintain secrecy, make sure that you check to see if privacy is available for that name. And that will protect your client and his, his new brand or service. So we've also discussed trademark and IP enforcement and how there might be a few more challenges for you if you do need to file disputes, as well as reaching uh, the owners of domains who really do want to sell them and have, and have the ability to help your client move their brand forward with that name. And Anthony, I think you were going to kind of talk a little bit about Gated Who Is, yes? Yeah, so uh, to wrap up here, and uh, you guys will notice on your webinar, there's a place to submit questions. Um, so if you do have any questions, we have about 15 minutes of time allotted to that. So just type your question in there and we'll, we'll answer it as best we can. 
Um, but as far as looking forward, as I mentioned, uh, the temporary spec uh, expires uh, in May of 2019, and the domain industry is working towards uh, final uh, structures and models for who is that will apply to all registries and registrars. There are a lot of questions still up in the air as far as um, what European registries and registrars are required to do according to the letter of the law versus what ICANN is requiring of them contractually. Um, there have been a couple lawsuits filed in Germany to uh, attempt to shed light on some of these gray areas, um, which are still outstanding. Um, in conversation with the industry, it, it looks like we're moving towards a gated who is model. And by that, I mean, have a who is database that contains all the records, but restrict who is able to access those records to um, parties with legitimate interests, law enforcement, um, IP, uh, practitioners, um, governments, different, different things like that. The, the question of who and how to vet that access is a, a fairly daunting task. Currently, the way this is working is if a registry or registrar gets a request for information on a who is record that is being redacted, it's essentially up to that registry or registrar to make a determination um, if they grant that request, if that request is legitimate. Um, so we're seeing uh, companies develop their own policies in the interim on this. You know, things like law enforcement requests, uh, we require a subpoena. Uh, many other registrars are the same. Um, so it would be it would be the stuff that you would expect. You you can't expect uh, to be an attorney representing a brand, calling up a registrar or sending a, a forcefully worded letter, and uh, really see much progress going that route. Um, you're typically going to be asked for a subpoena or a court order of some sort um, to furnish that information. Because again, registries and registrars, with the the gravity of the fines. Um, imposed by the European Union are erring on the side of caution. Um, you know, most of the players in this industry, aside from the big few, are are small players um, that you know definitely don't want to get their hands tangled um, in any mess here. Um, we're also going to see over time. Uh, many of you are aware of companies like DomainTools.com and other websites that aggregate who is data. Um, historical data, I mean, obviously that historical data has been aggregated, so it's there, but we're seeing this data being replaced with redacted data or incomplete information, and, and we're going to continue to see that until that historical data um, is no longer easy to obtain. Um, but it is, you know, in summary, um, we know the who is that we're all used to is never going to be, is never going to return to what it was. Um, so unfortunately, that makes um, our jobs and many of your jobs um, more difficult um, in many aspects as we've gone over. But um, there are still ways to to address these things. And um, as we work with generally, you know, every registry in the world, um, you know, we have insight into a lot of the moving parts, and we are here to offer advice and. Um, any questions that you or your clients have. So feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, you'll, you'll get our contact information in the, um, in the webinar and we'll send a follow-up email. Um, so Kimberly, are there any questions? Yes, there are. There are a couple uh, from Bob. And this one might be for you, Anthony. Uh, he wants to know, can SSL cert issuers such as DigiCert, see the WHOIS information to permit SSL certs to be issued. Are they, what are they doing now? I'm guessing that's going to be gated WHOIS if that ever happens. Um, that will be gated. We do have a process with that, but that, that process is still able to be done with the SSL issuers. So Bobby. right now it's still happening with, I'm seeing that the, the requests come in, so they must have yeah, a way. So so we get requests, for example, when uh, private registration uh, is enabled, and that's another argument for private registration in that there's a published email address there. Um, so they, they know how to contact you and then you can contact them back. And a lot of times the registrar will get involved in that process as well as we do. Um, so we haven't seen any, any major effect in that. 
Okay. Perfect. And there's a question from Aaron. If I find a domain that is very similar to my own, what should the first step, what should first step should I take if I am unable to contact the website owner through their own website? What methods have you found most effective? Well, that's a big question. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, the, the Whois database is mostly redacted. However, there are other ways. I mean, I have gone to social media. I have gone to other, uh, you can sometimes do some research as to ownership of that registrant of other domains and reach them that way. Uh, there have been times when you know, before I became a domain broker and I was buying domains, I had to contact a domain broker because of the network aspect of it. And that's probably the most important part is having that network because with as many millions of websites as there are out there, it's pretty hard to find that needle in a haystack unless you, you know, you've got some, some paths to follow. So, uh, we're always happy to help you with that. If that's a question you have about reaching a registrant, you can always contact us and we can help guide you in that direction. And we have a question from Maria. If we checked a person has registered a domain name under a trademark held by our client and we are interested in sending a cease and desist letter before starting a proceeding, how can we know the contact's details? Anthony, you want to answer that one? Yeah, that's that's a very difficult one. And in many cases, um, you will not be able to get that contact information. Um, one other avenue in looking at that is look at the, the chain of uh, providers in the situation. You have the registry and the registrar, um, as well as the hosting provider. Um, each of these entities have their own terms and conditions in dealing with trademark infringement. I know our terms and conditions um, prohibit trademark infringement or infringing content. Um, so when we get an inquiry or a, a cease and desist, we will pass that along to the registrant ourselves uh, on your behalf when you're inquiring. Now, our policy specifically state that if we don't get a response from the registrant within, I believe, 15 days, that we will put the domain on hold. Um, so, uh, in our system, you'll, you'll minimally, uh, get a response. Um, unfortunately, other registrars don't follow those practices, um, uh, especially when you're dealing with the smaller ones, you know, in, in a smaller country or uh, on the other side of the world. But that's, that is one of the downsides here with GDPR is, um, the ability to send out a CMD. Um, and so as Kimberly mentioned, before, what one tactic is really filing, starting that UDRP process, the registrar will pass that information along, um, and you know then you're then you're going through that process. Um, so it's it's uh, somewhat trial and error. When you're getting into country codes, um, it could be a whole different story. So um, UDRP is generally ICANN sponsored names. If you're looking at country code names. Um, different registries have different policies. We're familiar with all those policies, so we can perhaps provide some guidance um, on any cases that come up for you. Okay, and Jeff has a question about why do registrars allow the registration of trademark terms to begin with? That's a good question, and one that we get asked by um, employees when they come in. Um, and Generally, registrars are not uh, the authority. They're not the arbiter on enforcement of trademark rights. There's no real way for a registrar to um, to know or be knowledgeable of all the trademarks registered out there. Um, obviously, we can be knowledgeable of the, of the bigger brands out in the world, um, but it really is um, something that um, you know, registrars are not in the job of doing. Now, um, if there are patterns with customers um, in registering infringing names, uh, many registrars, again, go back to their terms and conditions, um, and there may be some options there uh, to enforce that if you see a pattern. 
Um, but unfortunately, that's that's really where it ends. Okay, and we have a question from David. Hi, David. With the disappearance of who is as we once knew it, what are currently some of the best ways for domain owners interested in selling their names to make themselves accessible to buyers? I love this question because I love hooking up buyers and sellers. So here's what I've seen some people do, David, is uh, rather than just leave the page as parked, they will put up a one pager that has the contact information on it, a contact form, content, anything like that. Uh, if you have a, a, a bunch of websites, you can link to other websites. You can put up some content to help with SEO at the same time. And so uh, as most of us will research, we will eventually go to the site. Don't go to the site first. Don't go to the site first. That's <laughs> go to the site later because if it's not registered then the i uh your ip provider is actually selling that information so you would uh, put up a little site for that when people are visiting they will be able to contact you directly you don't necessarily have to put a price up there just say one of, are you interested in the site contact us and you know there there also is hopefully in in this next round of regulations, the ability for domain registrants to opt in to their information being shown, which would, you know, alleviate the whole problem. But until then, you know, put up those little single page sites and hopefully that will get you some more buyers. Further to that, Kimberly, the opt in process is it actually is in the temporary spec, but oh, cool. the wording and language states that registrars um, must implement as soon as practically possible. Um, so the wording really gives a big scope on to when, when registrars can implement that. We are working on the implementation on our site. So uh, the way it would work in the system is when you register a domain name, you can opt in to having your information, uh, your personal information published on the who is. Um, so I, I imagine with the final spec, that wording will be tightened up and it will be a, a requirement by a certain date. Um, so that, that will help uh, those that are looking to sell names, definitely. Okay, we have a question from Johan. I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, when you said that you ask a domain broker to get information about the owner of a domain, isn't the domain broker breaking the rules of GDPR, giving out personal information that you need? Or did I misunderstand the question? That's a good question. Generally, the domain broker will be doing the contacting for you, meaning that they won't be handing over information. Now, the domain brokers aren't, it, de it depends on for whom they're working, right? If it's a European company, then that may be a little bit different. But Anthony, you may want to explain that a little bit more. I would personally not be handing out that information to someone, but maybe perhaps guiding them to find it on their own. Correct. I haven't seen brokers. They, they tend to uh, keep client information confidential, but they will, they will act as a liaison in between. Okay, and Simon is is wondering, is it possible to start a UDRP proceeding without knowing who the respondent is? If so, which information does one submit? Yes, you can submit it without knowing. You can simply, uh, I don't have the, the legal terms for it right now, but you're basically saying the registrant of this domain name. And that's how you would submit your dispute prior to knowing who the registrant is. Okay, any other questions? Looks like we are right on time here. Anything else for you to say, Anthony? No, I just want to thank everybody for attending. Um, there will be a recording of this webinar available shortly after. And like I said, um, we plan on doing these uh, once per quarter on a timely topic. So hopefully you found this information useful and um, helpful in your daily practice. And uh, we thank you for taking the time out of your day. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all. Bye.